Um, I decided to do this video live with uh, my male uh, southern white lip who just shed. Um, I wanted to see mainly how he was going to be coming out of the new caging setup. Um, he's been in there about a week now. Uh, I was curious if it was going to turn him more or less defensive or anything. I would say overall he was about the same. He didn't musk me much, but I think a large part of that is because he's been able to see me so much more in there. Um, so he's a little more used to me approaching. Um, he's been using his water dish as a hide more now than he was before. Actually, I'd never seen him do that before. So that's a totally new behavior. He has a hide in there. He doesn't seem to like it as much as the hide he had previously. Um, it's a little bit taller, so maybe he doesn't like the space in there. I'm not sure. Um, I'll see over time as he uses it more and more. But as you can see, behaviorally, he's, he's pretty much the same as he always is. Typical white lip, he's very active. Uh, eventually, though, he does settle down. Sometimes he'll even go to sleep in my arms after I have him out for a while. But you can see no defensive behavior. He hasn't musked at all today, um, which helped because I got him out very quickly. Um, it's tough to find that balance with white lips where you want to get them out of their cage quick because the longer it takes, the more um, you know stress they get. But you also um, don't want to scare them or anything. Some marks on your side. What's that? The new substrate, I guess. Uh, but you can see he's a very, very well-mannered white lip. Uh, the best that I've ever worked with, for sure. Uh, he has never, ever taken a shot at me. Uh, that doesn't mean that he can't. Uh, and I still try to keep him out of situations where he might want to do that. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, with you guys was acclimating older animals. We talked about doing it with hatchlings and how I, you know, raise short tail hatchlings specifically. Um, but I think I wanted to do, a lot of people often ask how you do it with older animals, because sometimes you might, you know, adopt an animal or buy an older animal, get an adult animal. And I think it's more difficult with adults sometimes than it is with babies. And now it depends on the species. There are some species where babies are more fragile and adults are hardier. Um, freaking bamboos in my hair, what little hair I have. Uh, but I think with some species, like short tails specifically, the babies are much hardier and they actually get less hardy as they get older. And less hardy might not be the right word, but they're more sensitive to improper husbandry or husbandry changes, whereas babies kind of adapt a little bit better. And I think a big part of that with short tails is the lung structure of the adults. I'm going to slide over a little bit here because that is annoying the absolute shit out of me. Oh, there's fucking one over here too. Hang on one second. I'm just going to move this piece that I have draped over here, and that might help. All right, buddy. All right, we're back. Um, so that's the bamboo that I actually cut down and used in the cages. For those of you that watched me set those cages up for him and for the female spotted python, uh, that's actually the bamboo I cut down and, and put in there. Um, so he's used to that from coming outside. So he's, he's actually used it quite a bit. Um, so anyways, with, with the short tails, as I was saying, uh, with that lung structure, they're such heavy breathers as adults that I think they're more sensitive to inadequate husbandry, whereas babies are kind of more forgiving. Um, so like I said, it's species dependent, but as far as acclimating and building a relationship with, um, you know, an older animal, you know, a second, I hate that it doesn't show me the comments. Okay. Um, so, you know, it depends on the species, how you want to go about it. Uh, first and foremost, getting the animal from somebody that's established that knows that species is going to help you out a lot, uh, because you're going to have that to go on, especially if it's a newer species for you or something you don't have a ton of experience with. Um, and even if you do, they're going to know that animal better than you do. Uh, so their advice is, is worth, you know, listening to and, and taking into account for sure. Will you just relax? I should have left the thing down and put him up in the tree and he could have just chilled there. Um, it's so hard to concentrate on talking and other things when he's moving and moving and moving. I'm constantly trying to adjust. Um, should use the short tail for this video. But he will, like I said, eventually he'll calm down and, and just chill out. But um, so, you know, you want to talk to the person that the animal came from, see how they set up. Same thing as a baby. You want to mimic the setup as best you can uh, within reason. And uh, you know, let the animal settle for a while, or as a baby might settle in a day or a week, um, you know, sometimes they do take longer. Adults might take longer to settle in because 
a lot of times they're coming from an environment where they've been for years and now everything changes. The smells, the sights, the temperature, even if you use the exact same temperature and humidity, it's going to fluctuate within your setup and within your environment because maybe you live in Arizona and maybe they live in Maine. And so the temperature and humidity and ambient in your home is different. So it affects how the cage runs, how often the heat's on versus, you know, lower. So all those things are going to, those little subtle changes are going to affect the animal. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading your comments here, Lori. Sometimes they arrive with baggage. Yeah, they just certainly do. And, and sometimes it's not even so much baggage as like, I, I did a program uh, with uh, my friend Josh when he was working up at Nerd and we took some of his personal animals from his house. So I was holding one of his tegus. Now he was standing there with his tegu for, you know, 20 minutes and this thing was great. I had it and within like a minute or two, it got really, really fidgety. Um, it started like trying to do everything it could to get away from me flopping onto the floor. Uh, I almost dropped it. I barely caught it at my like toes basically because it got so restless. He took it back and it was fine. And it, it came down to simply the way that I was holding and supporting the animal was different than he normally did. And so the animal was used to years and years of how he did it. And even though I wasn't doing anything threatening or, you know, I wasn't uncomfortable with the animal, just how I was holding it was different enough to where the animal didn't feel comfortable. Um, and so that happens, especially with more intelligent species, like they get used to those little things and they get used to routine and how things are done. And when those things are done differently, um, it confuses them. And sometimes that confusion leads to behavioral issues or as we see it, behavioral issues uh, where they might be more apt to bite. They might be more flighty. Uh, they might refuse food, all those different things that can happen because those little subtle changes. So the more consistent that you can be in the beginning, the better you're going to be. Um, and so that's why, like I said, you get it from an established person. Thanks, Brandon or Brand Brandon. I can't read that far. I think it says Brandon. Um, what's up, buddy? But, uh, you know, those little, little subtle things help. And then, um, you know, giving it that time to acclimate. And uh, it depends on the species. You know, white lips are more shy, whereas my spotted pythons and olive pythons are more outgoing. So if I was trying to acclimate an olive python, I would probably have it in a higher traffic room to begin with. Depending on the snake, you know, you're going to have to learn. The biggest thing to do doing this stuff is learning to read your animal's individual body language, to learn to read their cues, the information that they're giving us, telling us how something makes them feel. So while I'm telling you that I would do this with an olive python, if it's a super, super nervous olive python, then I'm not going to do that. But my olives, all the ones that I've gotten, have been fairly confident animals, where I find that them having that time to observe me doing my normal routine. Uh, same with African rocks, I found that, that helpful. That seems to help them understand you, your movements, and be more comfortable with you invading their space because now they feel like, you know, they have a better judgment call on what you're there for and what you're doing and how you move. Um, now, if it was a species like white lips, I don't know that that's necessarily going to help. Uh, he's only been in this new cage for a week. Now, my female's in a cage where she can see me, but I originally was going to put her in the living room, but she's in uh, another room now because I just don't think that she can handle that environment. Um, she doesn't like me being in the room at all. Uh, it triggers her nine times out of ten. Uh, oftentimes she'll strike the glass when I come in the room and she'll keep at it sometimes. If she wants food, she won't, which is ironic. If she wants food, she'll just come up to the glass and she'll sit there and wait patiently. Uh, but if it's not, she's not hungry or she doesn't think I'm feeding her, then she has no use for me whatsoever and I should just die. Uh, that's basically how she feels. Uh, and she shows me all the time. Um, so my original plan with her had to change because I don't think that that environment is going to be good for her. Whereas this snake is a lot more relaxed and so far he's done well in there. Uh, I've even seen him out a couple of days, um, even not necessarily during the day, but you know, early, late afternoon, early evening, he's popped out a little bit and hung out in the cool side and kind of watched things. If I've approached the cage, he hasn't gotten defensive. He hasn't struck the glass once. Um, but in his case, you know, the rack that he was in previously is right next to the stack of cages. So it was a really easy transition um, other than the cage environment itself. It's the same smells, it's the same room, it's the same amount of activity. So a lot of those things are consistent for him that he's been used to the last, you know, uh, six months or whatever the hell he's been there. I don't know how long he's been in that room, but it's been a while. Um, so that helps. But when you're getting an animal that's coming into a totally new environment, you've got to really focus on, you know, consistency, and focus on letting them settle and reading their body language. 
Uh, they'll tell you when they're ready to interact. They'll tell you when they're not. Um, you have to understand too with older animals, you may never get to a point where they're like this and you can sit here and chill with them. Um, and you may never get to that point with babies too. You know, individual animals, some of them just don't ever take to that. Um, and so that's something that you need to understand can happen. Uh, and your chances of that happening are gonna be less if you go to somebody that specializes in those animals, understands those animals, because we'll get a feel for how an animal is within the first few months of its life. And we can tell which ones are probably gonna acclimate better to handling, which ones are gonna acclimate better to a, a hand, more hands-off approach, you know, just moving them to clean kind of thing. Um, so I have, I have babies now um, that are fantastic, you know, took to handling right off the bat, very curious, very interested in that. They want to learn everything around them. There's no real fear in them. And then you get the ones that are very shy and reserved and come along slowly. Um, now with short tails, I have not yet produced one that I haven't been able to build a good relationship with, um, which I think once again is that consistency. All they know is me, all they know is how I approach them, how I deal with them, how I read their body language, how I, you know, give and take, and you have that give and take relationship. Um, but with, with older animals, especially, you know, like I said, with the white lips where they're more nervous, it's a lot more work. It's taken me over two years before I could take those pictures of that white lip outside. Um, two, two years and change to get to that point where that's the first time I've been able to pick that snake up. Um, I've had to use the shift box the rest of the time. She doesn't tolerate the hook when she's in her cage. Um, and so that's just me and her learning each other. She's an animal that's probably, you know, 10 plus years old, as I said. So she's set in her ways and what she expects. And the only way that I have to understand that is to learn her body language and learn, you know, her mannerisms and how she's behaving. Um, but there's no exact science there, you know. Um, like I said, every animal is going to be a little individual. And so you're going to have to tailor stuff and work with it. That's not a snake I'm ever going to be able to sit here and do this with. And I've, I've accepted that. Uh, I don't want to push her beyond what I feel is, is her reasonable limit. And so now the relationship that I want to have with her is just her being a little more receptive to me coming in the room, uh, which she is more receptive now than she was in the beginning. In the beginning, she was smashing her face off the glass 24-7 if somebody was in there nonstop. She'd hit it 90 times, shake her head from rattling it so hard. I mean, she just would not quit. And now I would say probably one in 10 times that I go in there, she's actually uh, hitting that. Yes, uh, I was talking about that at the beginning of the video that is a bunch of bamboo. That's actually the bamboo that I used in his cage and in the spotted python's cage. Um, now, one thing that I'm gonna need to do for his cage that I haven't done yet um, is I'm gonna need to find some better ways to keep the humidity where I want it. Uh, even with the Repta chip in there, and I have the water source near the heat source. Um, the humidity is still getting too low, um, especially now all of a sudden the humidity broke today. So yesterday the humidity was fine because the humidity outside was 92%. So, you know, it's uh, not gonna get that low in the cage even with the heat source. But now today, I, don't, I didn't look at the humidity today, but it's comfortable out here. I haven't been comfortable outside in a month. Um, so the humidity has gotta be you know, less than 50% today. Um, and so now his cage was down to about 45% at its driest spot, um, which I really don't want it that dry. Uh, and come winter time, I'm gonna have to really make some adjustments to that. Um, fortunately, where he's sitting is, is a little bit damper, but I'm gonna have to make some kind of microclimates in there for him, uh, especially the olives will handle it pretty well. Uh, the spotted python will handle it pretty well, you know, up and down a little fluctuation, but these guys don't seem to handle it as well. Obviously he looks good right now. So even though it got dry, he's not too dried out or anything. His skin's, his skin's good. He's nice and hydrated. Um, as much time as he's spending underneath his water dish, he just pops his neck out and drinks. So he's staying hydrated really well right now. Uh, plus he just shed. And he had, if you guys saw the video, he was actually having a bad shed when I put him in the cage. Um, but he ended up having a, a, you know, finishing it off himself. Yeah, um, I have a big bag of sphagnum upstairs, so I'm gonna do something along those lines. Um, I might actually just put some clumps of it in his existing hide, um, just to give him that, that space. He doesn't go in the hide much, but maybe with that in there, that added kind of fluff to it, will eat up some of that vertical space of the hide, and uh, maybe he'll be more apt to use it. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Right, buddy? 
Uh, I really love this snake though. That's also why I'm like petrified to try to breed them because if the female kills him and I'm stuck with the one that hates me, it's gonna really suck. Um, so I'm being very, very careful about that and he's nowhere near big enough to go in with her yet. Um, you know, I wanna put another probably foot and a half, two feet on him if I can. Um, a lot of times little males are good, but with a female that size where she's eight or nine feet, um, I want him to have enough size to at least not look like a total prey item to her. Uh, we'll see how that goes when the time comes. I have some, some plans in mind that I'll be talking to some people that are far smarter than I am with these animals to see what, uh, what they would do. Don't get mad at me. A little piece of shed stuck around his spur. I'll get that off later. Um, so anyways, with acclimating these older animals, uh, slow and steady is really the key. So you want to be confident with them because when you're nervous, they're nervous. Uh, they definitely read that. They definitely sense it. The less you're worried about getting bit, the less you're worried about how they're going to react, the less likely you are to create that reaction. Um, and I try to explain that to people a lot when you talk to people that are convinced that feeding aggression comes from, or, or cage aggression comes from feeding in the cage. You'll often see that people will stop doing it, they'll listen to advice, and then they end up getting bit. But what happens is in their mind, even though they've, they've changed, they're still not believing that it's true. And so they're changing their approach going into the cage because they're expecting that reaction now. So they're actually creating the reaction they're afraid of with their change in behavior that they may not even realize. You know, it could be simple as normal, you reach in like that, and now you're, you're doing a little bit of that. And that little bit of hesitation could be enough to tell that animal, all right, something's different, something's off. If it's a reactive animal, then it's that much more likely to pick up on that subtle little change and react accordingly. Um, so a lot of times how our animals are is a reflection of how we're approaching them. And it might be things that we don't realize. Um, so you really have to pay attention to your behavior. If you're newer to working with snakes and you're having trouble with a particular snake, it might be worthwhile to set up a, you know, your phone or something, record yourself working with the animal and then watch it later and look. And then that way, if you do get bit or something, you can look more clearly over and over and start to learn that animal's pattern of body language and see where that animal's giving you signals that you may have missed in the moment that maybe when you watch over and over again, you see a slight hesitation in the animal. Maybe the tongue flick duration or frequency changes. Maybe the pupils change. Um, so if you're able to do that, that can be a really good tool for you, almost like a baseball player breaking down their swing. You know, see what you're doing and try to figure out what you're doing wrong that's causing the animal to react negatively. Uh, so that can be a great tool that we have with modern technology uh, to be able to do that and to, uh, to go in and watch how our behavior might be triggering behavior in them. Because we can't talk to them. We can say, hey, you know, I'm not here to hurt you. They don't necessarily understand that. What they understand is signals that you're giving them. But they don't understand human behavior any better than we understand snake behavior. Well, maybe we understand snake behavior a little bit better um, because we're able to sit down and communicate about it. The snake's not sitting in a group of snakes and they're like, ah, listen to what this guy did. This fucking asshole came in here and he touched my, my tail. I can't believe him. What a jerk, you know? So we're able to talk and discuss ideas, share uh, knowledge, whereas these guys don't necessarily get that. They get stuff passed down and ingrained in them from their parents, which is also why if you're working with good tempered snakes, um, you can often get better tempered babies over time and, and generations. Um, there are some things that affect that otherwise. It's really annoying me. I want to get that, but I don't want to upset him. I think I'm going to have to use a wet towel for that one. Uh, you can see though he's starting to relax now. If I can hold my arm up for a long time he might stay, but my arm's already getting shaky. I haven't eaten yet today, so I'm crabby. Um, but yeah, so those, those, you know, recording yourself I think could be a great tool. Um, and it's not something that I've necessarily used myself, but if I got to a situation with a snake where I, I felt like I wasn't progressing, I certainly would. Um, and somebody that's less, uh, you know, comfortable with snake behavior, I think that's a great way to go about it. Right? Do you think they could learn from that? Tell him. He's like dead to the world now. It's not even tongue flicking. If I move though, he'll probably well there. You can see a little head movement there. But not even a tongue flick. He's totally relaxed now. Um, so anyhow, so you know, that's a tool that you can use. Um, basically everything you do, you wanna see how the animal's reacting to it and move slowly, deliberately and confidently, but slowly. Uh, and don't push too far. Short sessions go a long way. So even if you handle the animal for 30 seconds, 
um, and it's a positive experience, that's better than 10 minutes that turns into a negative experience. Um, and then over time, as you have more and more consistent positive experiences, you can change things up. And then once you start to see that the animal's not nervous with you at all, um, if you get to that point, that's where you can take animals into a different environment and start introducing them to other stimuli that you know, might affect how they're going to interact with you. Uh, one thing that I've mentioned in the past, probably the single biggest thing in successfully working with snakes and having them accepting of handling is having them comfortable in their cage environment. If they're not comfortable in their caging, they're not going to be comfortable anywhere else. Um, you know, you want them to be 100% comfortable in there. Now, sometimes they get so comfortable they don't want to come out. Um, and that's okay if they get to that point. It's actually great for the animal because now it's comfortable where it's going to spend 99% of its time. Um, so while I enjoy working with snakes, having them come out, I enjoy taking them to new stimuli. If they're not open to it, there's no reason to push it on it. There's no benefit for the animal at that point when the stress is outweighing the potential benefit of whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, so you always want it to be where, you know, if you are stressing the animal, it's minimal and the long-term benefit is worthwhile. So like I tell people, you know, with, with like ball pythons, those are not snakes that naturally go in the water. But if there's a health issue with that snake that can be fixed by putting it in the water, then the long-term benefit is going to outweigh that short-term uh, stress. So, you know, things like that are something that you have to look at. You have to kind of weigh the pros and cons of what you're doing and decide, is this best for the animal in the long run? Um, and that's why I did the shift box with the white lip. I could have sat there and kept fighting with her and fighting with her and fighting with her, but it wasn't beneficial to her to constantly have negative interactions. So that shift box allows us to have positive interactions or neutral. Neutral is okay too. It doesn't always have to be positive, uh, but you want it to at least be neutral. You want to stay away from negative interactions as much as you can. Now there comes time sometimes where there's a health issue and you're going to have to have a negative interaction. Once again, at that point, you've got to put the animal's best interest in mind and say, okay, you know, this animal has an infection in its mouth. I'm going to have to restrain it to fix it. Um, then that's, that's so be it. Um, and while it is best if you can handle those kinds of issues yourself, of course, uh, sometimes with certain animals, especially ones that, that you're likely to jeopardize your relationship, sometimes it's better to take that animal to the vet, even if you can do it yourself, um, because now that negative experience goes on the vet, not on you. Um, so that is something to consider, like those that keep parrots or have kept birds, some of them really, really react to getting their nails clipped. So if you have somebody else clip their nails instead of you, and then afterwards you comfort them, they don't associate that negative experience with you. They look at you as you came in and you saved them essentially. Um, so, you know, snakes, we can do things like that too. And they may not be all on the same level as that parrot, as far as intelligence goes, um, but they're certainly capable of recognizing people, depending on the species um, and how those interactions with those specific people have gone. I mean, I've seen African rock pythons that I could do anything with, but a certain person even comes in the room and they're immediately on the defensive because they don't like that person for, you know, how they handled them at a certain time. Or sometimes it's just scent related, presence related things that we don't even really understand. It's right in my mouth, dude. Um, I do try to keep him out of my face more than some of my other animals just because I know how white lips can be and they can turn on a dime and, and all of a sudden get nervous. Um, and breathing on that animal, prey and predators do that. So an animal that's more reactive, you're likely to elicit a bite to the face if you're talking at them and breathing on them. Um, you know, not all animals react to it, but some do, and so you always want to be aware of that. Uh, but behaviorally, working with those animals, have a goal in mind, work towards that goal, but be willing to sacrifice that goal for the betterment of the animal. So if you come into a situation where, you know, it's just not working, and you know you've done everything possible you've done research you've talked to people you've done everything you can do and it's just not getting to where you want it to go find a compromise that works for you and the animal mainly on the animal's behalf um, obviously we have to be able to get them out to clean them we have to be able to do certain things but maybe if the animal's that reactive maybe look at doing a bioactive enclosure for that animal so really you may only have to go in there and actually mess with the animal on rare occasions uh, when you do total swap outs or whatever it is. If you do true bio, uh, you won't have to go in there very often. 
but you have to do true bio. A lot of people do bio lazy and half-assed, and at that point, it's, it's not really working in the way that you think it is if you're not doing it properly. You don't have the proper drainage on the proper, you know, uh, whatever it is that you need. I don't, I don't really do bio, so I, I am running my mouth without knowing, but I do know that doing it properly is very, very important if you actually want to have a system that works for itself. Um, and I've been trying to get a certain someone to do a bio video for the channel. Um, and I am trying and I'm waiting and holding out for that person because they're really, really knowledgeable about it. And they have a lot of cool animals set up that way. So uh, once he stops being a, a jerk, uh, I'll get over there hopefully and shoot that. And I think that'll be a really interesting video for people to see. Because um, my whole thing is it may not be something that I'm into, but if you're going to do it, I would rather see people do it right. And so if I can provide a platform to educate people on how to do it properly, uh, then I would like to do that. You know, uh, some of the things that I talk about on this channel and uh, discuss may not be something that I do myself and may not be something that I'm necessarily gung-ho with doing, uh, but I do feel like I would rather educate people and see people do things right. Like, I don't cut eggs, but I would rather educate you in a proper way to cut eggs so that if you're doing it, you're not harming the animal or you're least invasive that you can be. Because people are going to do what they want to do. Um, you know, all I can do is try to make that experience more um, safe for their animals because that's my major concern. Your safety, I'm not going to lie, it's not my major concern. My major concern is your animal safety. It uh, doesn't mean I don't want to see you be safe, uh, but I'm more worried about them than you. It's just who I am. I like animals better than I like people. Um, so I'll cut this short. I'll post it up. I'll, I'll check the comments on here, uh, see if there's anything I missed. And uh, let me look real quick while I've got you here. Hey, Sam. Uh, yeah, you're very late. I'm just about to end the video. Let me see. Uh, I, got, I think I got everybody's comments uh, responded to on here, so we'll cut this short. But uh, definitely acclimating older animals can be tough, but the more you learn about the species, the more you spend time with the individual, even from afar, sometimes just sitting in a room and observing them from far enough back where you're not necessarily, you're always going to affect them behaviorally somehow with your presence, but least invasive that you can be so that you're able to uh, kind of learn how they move in the same way they need to learn how you move. Uh, sometimes with some of my animals like that, I'll just open the cage, sit there and read a book or mess around on my phone. Not even so much pay attention to them, pay att enough attention to where they don't get out and hurt themselves or anything, but just kind of let them approach things at their pace when they're comfortable. They may not come out at all, they may. Um, and you just work with that. A lot of animals are more receptive once they're on the move and coming out than going into their space and taking them out. So that's another thing you can utilize to your advantage uh, is do that. Awesome, that's good to hear. Um, and then once uh, the animal goes in there, you'll have to watch that again because sometimes the animal itself will infect, uh, infect, affect the environment a bit too. Uh, so you'll definitely keep an eye on that. But me and this guy are going to head out. I'm going to put him back in his cage. I've got to get some food and get some other snakes clean. So uh, hope you guys found this uh, informational. Uh, it's way longer than I intended, which happens a lot. We'll see you guys. Where's my end button? Damn it.